Welcome to the Connect the Dots podcast. Jeffrey Klein has conversations with a diverse array of successful people, sharing their stories to educate, inspire, and entertain. Here is your host, Jeffrey. My guest today is Isaac Caldero, who made history as the first ever athlete to win NBC's American Ninja Warrior, taking home a million dollar prize, and more importantly, I think gaining the title as the first American Ninja Warrior champion. At the age of 15, a good friend introduced Isaac to climbing and he was instantly addicted. It's become his passion and his life's pursuit. Uh, and as a big part of his passion for climbing involves scouting new areas and performing death-defying free solos. He had important. He, he has played an important role in the establishment of some of the most recognized climbing destinations all over the world. Now, when he's not dabbling in one of his numerous hobbies, as Isaac travels the world, inspiring people of all ages, and Isaac and his girlfriend have opened Synergy Climbing and Ninja, a bouldering ninja training and fitness center in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he currently lives. Welcome, Isaac. Glad to be here, man. It's good to meet you in person and. And match your name with the face. <laughs> there you go. That's uh, well. I, I've seen your face before somewhere uh, on TV. I think that's <laughs> where it was. Uh, Isaac, I like to start at the beginning. So, where were you born, and what did your parents do for a living? Uh, well, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, in 1982. And um, at the time, my parents actually uh, they they came from Europe um, to New York City, where they met, and then they actually got converted by uh, Mormon missionaries, and then moved to Utah, and then that's where I was born. Uh, my mom was basically a stay-at-home mom raising five kids, and my uh, my dad was like a technical writer from or for an old uh, software company called WordPerfect at the time. Um, oh, I remember, I yeah. remember WordPerfect. <laughs> yeah, I used WordPerfect. Like, one of the first like ten employees. Um, obviously, they they don't exist anymore. And then eventually, he he turned into a a professor. He teaches philosophy at a local college there. Awesome. Uh, so growing up, did you? know what you wanted to do when you when you were you know so obviously you, you introduced to uh climbing at 15 but prior to that as a youngster did you have certain ambitions of i want to go and do this yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting actually when i was really young i was completely obsessed with like uh, native american culture and I, I i genuinely wanted to be like an indian i wanted to live off the land i wanted to go ride around horses and like hunt and gather things and and i just always remember that in the back of my head i was like i want to escape the city and go live live off the land um, but then obviously I, I grew out of that and, and then started like developing a passion and, and an obsession with uh, m uh, magic and being a magician and doing mm -hmm. escape, escape artist type stuff. So I'd have my, my brothers and my dad and people like tie me up and I'll try to escape. And so that, that developed a, a big, um, like a, a big person in my life was Harry Houdini, who, who really kind of like motivated me as a young child. Yeah. So I have a very good friend who is also a, a very skilled magician. It's not what he does for a living, but he could. Um, and my son dabbled in it for a little bit. Uh, and I, I loved what magic can do to, you know, the surprise and delight that you can bring to the audience. I mean, to me, that's the, the real um, reason why you do it and to, to, some, to kind of, um, and I also think that part of, you know, being a good magician is, you know, the presentation. Obviously there are tricks and you have to have skill for some of the sleight of hand, um, but being able to tell a good story. Uh, so was there anyone when you were growing up who was really good at telling stories? I guess my, my dad was always really, really good. He's a pretty animated, kind of a intense human being. Um, he's also like a, um, you know, on, on his main passion and hobby is life is, apart from working and having family, was uh, being like a stand-up performance, uh, mm -hmm. like poet um, and artist. And so, yeah, he's very animated. He's, he would just always get me really like in tune with the story. Uh, with his just with his energy and his body and we used to play this this game when we were kids and he, you know he it would help us go to sleep at night but basically we would all sit in a room as we're like trying to fall asleep and he would start a story and then the next person would continue the story and we would continue telling these stories over and over until we'd all fall asleep <laughs> i love that and i i've played that same game with my kids where you you know the story evolves and and you see where it takes you so that's that's really fun uh so rock climbing you're 15 what were you doing right before rock climbing? What was kind of your passion? Were you doing magic a lot at that time? No, so I kind of, I got a little bit out of magic and I started getting more into like a more like physically active sports, um, mm -hmm. like totally against my parents' will. Like they, they wanted me to like read books and be smart and watch movies and, and be like more studious. And I was like, no, I'm, I want to go outside and hurt myself and go ride mountain bikes and go skateboarding and go kind of like, I was a daredevil. I wanted to like, 
fill my body and my mind with adrenaline. Um, so I and where, where do you think that came from? That. Um, I don't know. I think, I think all, all human beings as, as young kids in general, we have that natural desire to just like want to monkey around and climb on stuff. And I, I guess I just kind of took it to a whole nother level, um, whether my parents wanted me or, or not to. And so, yeah. I, and so I started you started climbing at about 15 and pretty quickly became very good at it and really seemed to kind of become obsessed with it. What did your parents think about that? Well, so initially they, they were not very keen on me rock climbing. Um, they only wanted me climbing indoors at the gym. And so at the time, like, and they, they were, they were supportive to a point where they would like drive me to the gym, but they wouldn't pay for my membership or anything. So I was like cleaning toilets, um, in exchange for a membership at the gym. And then eventually I, I became old enough to get a job there and work at the gym and, and start teaching people how to climb. Um, and then a really good friend of mine who got me into climbing initially, he would like sneak me out, you know, after school and sometimes during school and we would go to the mountains and actually climb on real rock. Um, and yeah, they, they had no clue about that for a while until later on in life. And then they realized they're like, well, <laughs> he's and so was the, that your first job working at the, the gym? Um, my, my first real job was actually, um, I worked at the bed and bath department at JC <laughs> And so, yeah, I was, I was just out there selling um housewives like blankets and and pillows and random stuff like that and then <laughs> stocking shelves and yeah the, the, that didn't last very long and then eventually I, I was really psyched on working at the climbing gym and and working at the low the climbing gear shop right next door so you're you've been around the world both because of climbing and now obviously because of american ninja warrior what do you think is the most surprising place that you found yourself whether it was a location or engaging with someone that you know, as a younger self, you would be like, I, I can't imagine I'll ever be, and then fill in that blank. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard. Like I've, I've been to so many cool places that were, they were all kind of like surprising, but I guess uh, there was one uh, trip in particular, which was the last time I went to France um, on a climbing trip. Um, this is maybe, I don't know, 2012 maybe. And um, I, I was planning this trip with some friends of mine, but I hadn't really like uh, set up a place for me to stay at. And so I'm, at the time, you know, like the Jeep, they call them the Jeeps, these little French huts that you stay in and they're really expensive. And I was trying to like cut, you know, nickel and dime thing and try to figure it all out. And it literally came down to like the last day before I was leaving to France. And, um, about a month prior to that, I met these French ladies when I was guiding in Zion national park. Um, and they're like, Oh, you should hook up with my friend, Philippe. He lives in France. He's an older guy. You should take him out rock climbing. He used to climb. And so I, I was kind of messaging this dude back and forth, um, throughout this time. And, didn't hear anything. And then the day before I was going to France, all of a sudden I get this random email from Philippe and he's like, he's like, yeah, of course you can come stay with me. Um, I live out in the woods in this random cabin. He's like, meet me. And I'm familiar with Aries, like meet me by the carousel downtown. Just look for a big, tall French guy with a big black dog. And I was like, all right. So I, I show up in France and I just, I meet this guy there at this right by the carousel and start talking to this guy's name, Philippe. And I'm like, wow, you're, you're amazing. He actually speaks better English than I do. I'm like, who are you? Um, and yeah, it turns out like uh, he's actually the CEO of Doctors Without Borders, which is oh, like wow. kind of a big deal. Yeah. And so he was kind of like on this hiatus um, where he just goes out to the, his cabin in the woods and smokes cigarettes and reads books and hangs out with his dog. Um, so yeah, he, he totally uh, hosted me at, and I took him out rock climbing. I gave him a pair of shoes and a crash pad and we had a really good time. And I don't know, I just would never think I'd be like sitting there in the middle of the woods in France with the CEO of Doctors Without Borders. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible where things can lead you. Uh, so rock climbing, I think, at least when you get out of the gym, um, I think from an outsider, looks like it, you it's dangerous, you know? <laughs> and while I understand that maybe as a kid, you want to, you know, be physical and get out and do things, I think there becomes a point where you realize like something, you can hurt yourself. And I don't know that everyone is uh, as keen as you may have described to go out and, and test your physical limits. Is that part of the appeal of rock climbing that you, you know, the danger there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's climbing is kind of like as dangerous as you want to make it type of thing. You know, it kind of reminds me of like, like driving a car down the freeway, you know, you can follow all the rules. You can, you know, keep both your hands and your eyes on the road and, mm -hmm. you know, go the speed limit or you can kind of push a little bit, you can get a little wild with it or go a little fast. Um, and, and so it, it just kind of depends on how you feel and like who you are as a person and where you want to take it. And for me, climbing was initially actually terrified. And I was, I was probably one of the most cautious out of all my friends, but a lot of that was like this fear that had been installed by my parents. 
Um, and then something clicked at one point in time where I was just like, I kind of like this beer and I want to take it to a whole new level. And then it, it turned into where I actually enjoyed falling. I enjoyed getting into weird precarious spots on the rocks. Um, and then that initially, you know, or at that point turned into uh, doing more free solo and stuff like that, where I literally had my, my life in my own hands. And if I fall, I die. And I just, I really, really, yeah, I don't know. Have you seen the documentary free solo? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no good for well not good friends but i'm acquaintances with uh, alex honnold and we climbed yeah. in together i figured with people in that world you would get to know one another yeah. uh, so I, you know and, and i was listening to uh, kind of behind the scenes of the directors and where they said you know you basically have to be perfect or you die <laughs> so um why why is it worth the risk to put your life you know yeah so that yes yeah, so from a from an outsider perspective it's it's not as crazy as it looks although it is crazy, but you, like, you know, like, like in, in that movie, for instance, he's rehearsing that climb. He's done that climb hundreds and hundreds of times to the point where it's just like this test of like your, your mental fortitude and to be able to be like, yeah, I know I can hundred percent focus from A to Z all the way through this really intense moment that most people wouldn't be able to focus. Um, and, and that's what it's all about. And that's actually, I, I use that same mentality when I was training and, com and competing on Ninja Warrior. Um, for me, if I, if I fall, I die type of thing. I went into it with, with that mentality because you literally, you get one shot, one kill, you touch the water and you're done. Um, and so I think maybe that's something that kind of set me aside in the competition was having that kind of free solo mentality into the, into the game. It, it seems also from my, and I've watched a good deal of American Ninja Warrior that climbers do really well. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, that upper body strength for some of the, you know, cause it's one of the things I always find fascinating about American Ninja Warrior is take any one stage and it's pretty challenging. And, and even if you're going to do each stage, but to do a stage and then right afterwards have to then do another set of challenges when your arms may be shot from the last thing you did. And that's that kind of, um, endurance, and even though it's in a short period of time, I think there is kind of that, that short-term endurance to, to push yourself beyond the limits. Um, how much of it is physical training and how much of it is mental fortitude, as you said? Yeah, so I mean, uh, there's a lot of really talented, like physically able athletes, um, like phenomenal, like probably better athletes than I was at the time. Um, but to be able to perform at this physical level um and, and a big thing they don't really tell you about too on the show or they don't really advertise is that the competition goes throughout the night so it starts around 11 12 at night and it goes till sunrise so like the night i won i had just been competing and sitting in the the heat of desert nevada las vegas at you know three four five all the way till sunrise in the morning in like 100 degree weather trying to like stay strong and stay focused and stay healthy and stay awake and stay alert and and it just comes down to this moment where they're like, all right, you're up, like, let's do this. And you just got to turn it on and stay focused. And, and I, I feel like that kind of messes, messes with a lot of people. And it's really hard to train that. I know mm -hmm. some people try to like reverse their sleep schedule, but it's like everyone has like normal lives still that they have to go to every day. They can't just reverse their entire life and become a vampire or something, you know? For well, you know, I have, I have a good cousin who, who's a nurse and had at, at one point in his career was doing night shift. Um, and thankfully he doesn't anymore because I think we're not meant to, that's not our normal way yeah. of living, uh, at least for most of us. Uh, so that, that definitely adds an added element. Isaac, what do you think is the, the, the great appeal to American Ninja Warrior? Why has it become so wildly popular? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it just genuinely uh, inspires people. You know, they, they see the show, they see these stories and, you know, the producers and the, the, the way they, they format the show it really delivers like this kind of cool message about people overcoming certain mm -hmm. challenges and obstacles in life and, and, you know, you know, tr trans, uh, <clears throat> like putting that into the actual course itself, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I feel, I feel like everyone can relate to it. Everything, everyone can see the obstacles and be like, I can do that, or I want to do that, or I want to try it. And so it's really intriguing on that note. Yeah. And I mean, the, the popularity of, of the obstacle course in general, you know, I think for years it was kind of like, that's what they did in the army. And then, you know, now it's like, yeah. that's the, that's the workout. And I think for me, who doesn't like, you know, working out, uh, exercise itself, it, it gives some variety and it gives them some adventure to, to being fit, you know, and I think that's definitely part of the appeal of why these 
you know, Ninja Warrior gyms have become so popular. How has becoming the champion, you know, because at the time it was a big deal. Um, how much did, and maybe your involvement in general with American Ninja Warrior, you know, being a champion changed your life or not changed your life? Yeah, I mean, I feel like for the most part, <clears throat> my life hasn't changed a whole lot apart from, you know, obviously like people recognize me when I go certain places. Uh, people kind of treat me a lot different than they did in the past. Um, but other than like, I just, my life's a little more cozy now. You know, I have a home, things like that. Um, I'm still the same person. I'm still kind of, you know, living, living the same life that I was doing before, you know, traveling and rock climbing and, and just living my passion, trying to work as little as possible and play as much as possible. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I guess like the biggest thing that I can really think of that's fully changes um, back to on the note of like how people treat me is it's, it's been kind of interesting trying to like meet friends and people who genuinely like want to be my friend, like new friends. Obviously I have people who've known me for a long time, but uh, trying to meet new acquaintances and people who can see me more than just as like this champion, you know, and people introduce me all the time. They're just like, Oh, this is the ninja guy. And I'm just like, ah, my name's Isaac. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I think there's something about celebrity. Um, and I worked in the film industry and you see kind of it's skin deep. And so there, you know, people are enamored with fame and yeah. my children is, you know, and I'm like, we're just people. Um, and I think again, you know, you seem to be a very grounded person before and are a very grounded person after. And I've seen cases where people become famous and it, it, it changes them. Uh, how do you think you've been able to maintain that, you know, core of being, of being grounded? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, yeah, like it's, I guess it's part of my personality. It's just how I've been my whole life. But also I feel like, I feel like what I did is, you know, some that really makes me feel special and like, like cool about what I did in my life and with my, like my accomplishments is like, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like I did something cool that really truly inspires people. Um, I wasn't just like on like a movie or something, you know, um, like I have people all the time coming up to me saying like, Oh, like me and my mom lost like a hundred pounds because of you, you inspired me to do this. So I, I meet all my fans all the time and the things they tell me and, the, and the, the joy that I see in their eyes that I brought them it, I don't know, I guess it makes me feel like I actually did something special or, or important to like, to inspire them. So. Yeah, I think that, you know, it, it shows the impact um, and therefore it's, it's pretty remarkable and I think fulfilling. So I asked this to a lot of people in terms of, you know, people have a notion of what success is, um, but it really, I think, depends on your perspective. So in the eyes of Isaac, what, what does, how would you define success? Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all personal, um, you know, because, um, yeah, I have a lot of people who, you know, for them being successful is having a career going, you know, going to college, having a really good career, um, just having this security, this little nest, this home safe place. And for me, um, my version of success was to just always be doing what made me happy, um, whatever it was, was, you know, in my whole life, it was to not have security and to be very spontaneous and not have a home and just be traveling and living like a free bird all over the place um, from one, one day at a time, like one adventure to the next. And to me, that was what I wanted to do. And that's what makes me feel successful. Yeah. I, you know, I read a little bit about your, the kind of nomadic life that you've, you've lived. And, and I, I think there are people who will find that uncomfortable when they consider it. I think some people will be jealous of the fact that, you know, just to be able to really, because I think a lot of people are stuck in whatever circumstance they're in, for not necessarily good reasons, like obligation, guilt, you know, fear. Um, so you bought a house. So I guess my question was, when when did you make the decision to 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 settle down a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it, the the biggest thing was like, you know, I obviously I encountered a large sum of money. You know, I woke up one day and I had a million and one hundred dollars in my bank account, <laughs> and I was like, I, I obviously I want to do something special with this, um, you know, kind of an investment. And I was like, well, what, you know. I should buy a house and kind of have a place to where, you know, cause as a, a nomad living all over the, all over the place, all over the world, I'm always crashing on people's couches and here, mm -hmm. there, whatever. And so now I kind of have my own place where I can help. I can give that in exchange back to all my friends and, and just travelers coming through. And now I have a place where I can do that. Um, and so on top of the, just a good investment and just having like, like an actual place to call home and come home to after all the stressful travel and 
things like that. I don't know. I, I would never thought I would enjoy it as much as I did. And are you still, but you're still traveling quite a bit. Um, well, I mean, up until COVID, yeah, I was traveling quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, I'm doing appearances and stuff um, overseas and, and clinics and slideshows, things like that. What about climbing? I mean, you don't, you can still travel to go climb. Do you, do you still climb every day? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, you know, when it's, when it's not at the gym, you know, cause out here in Tennessee, the weather gets uh, pretty rainy. Um, mm. Yeah. Whenever weather's good, I'm, I'm out in the mountains and running around scrambling on rocks and having a good time. Um, you talked about the fact that one of the kind of um, significant things about becoming, you know, the champion and, and, the, and the kind of recognition was that you could inspire people. Uh, what inspires you? Yeah. I mean, I feel like at the end of the day, like, you know, seeing people just like being successful in their own way, you know, like what, whatever it may be, you know, what, whether they want to be a doctor or they want to be a podcast host, whatever, <laughs> whatever they're doing to make them happy. Um, that, that truly inspires me, you know, to see people just being their, the best they can be. Love that. Uh, so I'm, I, I always find this a curious question, which is if you could go back in time and give advice to your 21 year old self, what advice would you give yourself? As it's interesting because I don't know, I feel like when I was 21, even when I look back on it, I was, I was kind of doing everything I wanted to be doing. You know, there's, there really wasn't much more that I could have been doing more of or better. Um, I was pretty like successful for my own, mm -hmm. my own self. Um, but yeah, I guess, I don't know, like having better credit or something, <laughs> like focus a little bit more on having better credit. Like that's something now that's kind of like, you know, it took me a while to like build that back because I didn't even care about it at the time. And now I'm kind of like, I probably should have focused a little more on that. <laughs> um, so how involved are you with American Ninja Warrior? Is that, you know, are you still a part of it? I know you competed, you know, in season 10 was the last time. Yeah, it was either nine or 10. I can't remember. Um, it was a couple years after I won. But. So are you, are you involved with the, the organization of American Ninja Warrior? Will you compete again? What are your you know, kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm so, so I'm not like super involved with it as much anymore. Um, I kind of like check that off my list. You mm -hmm. know, it was like this big monkey on my back and now it's, it's not there anymore. And so right. it's really hard for me to want to get motivated again to go back into it. Um, I, I do enjoy that, the nature of the competition and a lot of the things that American Ninja Warrior is all about. Obviously, I'm not a super big fan of just like being on TV right. or being in the spotlight and things. So that that's a little stressful for me. And it's been nice to kind of step away from that for a while. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll see it. Like, it kind of depends on where the competition goes. I know this last season due to COVID, they kind of uh, restructured some of the competition and it's a little bit more based off of like speed. Um, and, and yeah, it's just a different format these days. That's not like super inspiring for me. It's not really my style yeah. versus like difficulty, you know, it's more based off really easy obstacles and just going really fast. Mm. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what, what comes in the future. If it gets me more inspired to train again, now I have my own ninja gym where I can actually train. Um, in the past, I didn't have that. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see what next year brings. It's interesting because um, I, I don't know why I make this comparison, but you know, we, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the show Wipeout, yeah. um, which is kind of the, <laughs> the odd, you know, weird brother of American Ninja, you know, cousin, where it seems that the purpose is to show people falling. To messing up, not not doing well. Whereas I think in American Ninja Warrior, we're all kind of rooting for the person to do well. Yeah. Um, and so, but I think when you take away some of the difficulty of it, then it's not as, as you said, kind of inspiring because if it's just you know how fast you can go versus some of those things is that you know the, those little cliff, you know those little ledges that you have to do and and then jump to the next one. You're like, how do they do that? Um, and I, I, again, I think. Uh, for me, and as for a lot of fans, it's it's that um, human spirit that you see being displayed there. Uh, so what, it, American Ninja Warrior is kind of in your rear view mirror. What's the next big thing for Isaac? Yeah, so like in, initially what drew me to getting involved in Ninja Warrior was that it was this impossible feat, you mm -hmm. know, and it was dubbed as impossible. No one could do it. And, and for me, I, I really want to be the first person to do this impossible feat because I knew I could do it and so now it's like I need to just I'm trying to find that next impossible um you know there's a lot of different ideas that I kind of brainstorm and dabble in but in general it's it's been kind of a weird <laughs> a weird kind of mind game for me because yeah there's just really nothing that can compare to what I already did and so yeah it's every day is 
me trying to explore different venues and try to figure out what I want to do next. Uh, I, I'll probably do a little bit of a dirt bike races. I've been kind of involved in that for the last like 10, 12 years, dirt biking, like enduro trail riding. Um, but I just did my first race a couple years ago. I'm going to do another one in about a month. And that that's kind of exciting. It's very, it's like a real life video game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so little, little things like that. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's going to be really hard for me to find something that's like, like that next tier of, uh, of like this biggest accomplishment in my life so is there anywhere that you haven't climbed that you want to climb um yeah so i haven't been to south america yet um mm -hmm. you know i'd love to go check out patagonia it's just you know it's been a staple like monumental pl like place in rock climbing and I, ha I still haven't been there um but yeah in general i feel pretty content with <laughs> all the places i've been um and i'll just continue to go back to all these these amazing places again you know i have friends all over the world that i want to go see and hang out with and you know, there's, there's beautiful rocks everywhere and beautiful people to hang out with. <laughs> beautiful rocks and beautiful people. I think that's uh, yeah. wonderful. Um, so we're at the stage where I ask some uh, rapid fire questions where they're meant to be as kind of off the cuff as, as you can, but uh, it doesn't always work out that way. So um, if they made a movie about your life, who would you want to play you? Um, that's probably uh, Antonio Banderas. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, should stories always have happy endings? Absolutely not. How, how else are we supposed to learn? We have to fail to learn, right? <laughs> Do you have a favorite emoji? Uh, probably the fist bump. <laughs> and how about a favorite social media platform? Um, I mean, I, I mostly use Instagram. I'm, in general, I'm not a super big fan of social media, but that's like my main platform. Uh, can you name one of your favorite songs? Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. I'm learning to play it on piano right now. <laughs> uh, have you ever, I don't know if you've seen, there's a ukulele, Jake, who plays it on ukulele. It's oh, really? I'll have to check phenomenal. that out. And my daughters, there's a, there's a cover of it that's been, that they keep repeating on, the, on that apparently amazing. The complexity of that song to me is what always I find remarkable that it, it, you know, starts here and then goes there and goes there and um, from a musical perspective, and I'm not that musical, I'm just blown away by it. Um, can you name a book that left a lasting impression on you? Um, the, the last book I, I read was, it's been a while, but it's this one called Holographic Universe. Hmm. Oh, it's kind of interesting concept on like how our surroundings are all like a holograph, you know, in our minds that we create our own reality. So it's kind of fun, fun thought. <laughs> I like that. Um, can you name one of your favorite movies? Uh, Pulp Fiction. Love me some Pulp Fiction. <laughs> I'm a big Quentin Tarantino fan, and, and uh, uh, it's hard not to recognize his genius. Uh, what's one thing you can't live without? Uh, definitely a bacon blue cheeseburger and fries. That's my go-to. I got to have that at least once a week. <laughs> and if you, Isaac, if you could be credited with inventing something, what would it be and why? Mm. I guess uh, my whole life I've been um, infatuated by making sounds um, with my body and my mouth and imitating sounds of nature. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, I don't know, some kind of sound box machine or something that mimics nature and sounds around you. <laughs> That's cool. I, I interviewed a, a beatbox artist, uh, world uh, champion, and what she can, the sounds she can make just continually blow me away. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, so I want to, you know, thank you, Isaac, for your time. And uh, it's been really great just to chat. Um, is there anything you're pr promoting at the moment or things you want to share? I want to give you the opportunity to kind of, you know, say whatever it is you on your mind or you want to let people know about. I mean, a apart from just uh, my new gym that me and my business partners opened here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of like the big thing that's going on in my life right now is just kind of running and maintaining that, you know, it's called Synergy climb and ninja and it's you know we combine world-class rock climbing with world-class ninja training and it's just it's a really cool place right downtown chattanooga come check it out <laughs> all right well i'll have to get down to chattanooga uh and if people want to learn uh, i guess the best way to get in touch with you is through your instagram yep absolutely yeah just my name isaac caldiero there's only one there's only one <laughs> uh well isaac this has been a real pleasure for me um and you're you're pretty much as down to earth as I would have anticipated, and, and but it's nice to kind of 
have that confirmation that someone appears as nice as they do uh, when they're on TV, because TV doesn't always do uh, justice to the person. Um, so I, I want to thank you for, for sharing your story um, and helping us connect the dots. Oh, thank, thank you very much, man. It's, it's been an honor and a pleasure meeting you and talking with you, and I'm glad you reached out to me. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this podcast. Please subscribe on your preferred podcast platform so you don't miss any future episodes. If you could also do me a favor and please leave a review on iTunes, I would really appreciate that. Remember, story matters and is the best way to connect the dots.